All right, so let me begin this evening again by reading for you um, the Beatitudes, uh, Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 12. Uh, if we haven't memorized these, I think uh, it would, we would do well to do that because these are things that can slip out of mind, and, and sadly, when they do, we, well, typically, we don't pursue what we're not aware of. So the more we're aware of it, the more we keep the goal before our eyes, the more we will pursue these things. Uh, Let's begin reading again in verse 1 of Matthew chapter 5. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. He opened his mouth and began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the gentle for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now, let me just say a couple of things that, um, that we've seen in the past that we just need to bear in mind. Remember that uh, you can't really have one of these without having all of them. Okay, they, they come as a package. And the particular blessings that are attached to them are not, are not blessings that are attached just to that particular virtue, but it's really an explanation of everything that Jesus has actually purchased for us. And it all comes as a package as well. You can't have one without the other. So if you belong to Jesus, all these virtues are in you by the Holy Spirit, and he's working them out in your lives. If you belong to Jesus, all of these rewards also belong to you, you will inherit the kingdom of heaven. Now this evening, we're going to be looking uh, particularly at um, verse 8, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Now just by way of reminder uh, this morning, uh, we did see that if we belong to Jesus, we will be merciful. And I, I just want to remind you again of the difference between the three concepts that we were looking at of justice mercy, and grace, because they're all involved in, in the gospel. Justice, remember, is getting what we deserve, both by way of reward and punishment. Mercy is not getting the punishment that we deserve for what we've done. And grace is getting something good or reward that we haven't earned or that we do not uh, deserve. Now, as I've said, all of these are involved in the gospel. We deserve justice. We had all sinned and were under God's wrath. But He showed us mercy. You know, we deserve to be in hell right now and for the rest of eternity. But we are not because of the mercy of God. And that is the only reason, the mercy of God. And the Lord has shown us grace. Not only will we not be in hell, but we will be in heaven enjoying the blessings that Jesus has actually earned for us. And by the way, it is just now for God to give us heaven because being in union with the Lord Jesus Christ, we now deserve, by virtue of His righteousness, those blessings that He has purchased for us. So again, think about it. We deserve hell, but He's given to us heaven mercy and grace. Now, this is all because, again, of the Lord's love, the love of God the Father, His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. The Father loved us, and He provided the payment. The Son loved us, and He made the payment. And the Holy Spirit loved us, and He is the one who has been purchased for us by the Lord Jesus Christ. He has been given to us by the Father and the Son. 
so that we might become like Jesus and inherit these blessings. And again, there's, there's two sides to this. Remember, if we're trusting in Jesus, we have his righteousness. The blessings belong to us. But the way that works out in our experience is that these virtues are in us and continue to grow and they show us that we are, in fact, the heirs of these blessings. But let's not miss what we saw this morning, and that is, as those who have received mercy, we are called to show mercy. But we also saw that if we are to show mercy, we have to be willing to pay the price. The mercy that the Father showed us was not free. It was very costly. It cost him his son. The mercy that Jesus showed us wasn't free. He had to lay down his life. It cost the Good Samaritan time and effort and money. And by the way, forgiveness as well. He had to be willing to set aside the animosity that existed between the Samaritans and the Jews in order to reach out and help this Jewish merchant who had been injured by those thugs that met him on the road. It cost the master who forgave his servant 10,000 talents to show mercy. Whenever we show mercy, it is going to cost us something. Actually, whenever we do, whatever we do for the Lord, it is going to do that. It takes time to do good. It takes effort. Everything we do requires some kind of exertion. It may cost money. There's very few things we can give away that are, that are free. Uh, when we forgive, it means that we must bear the injury. If we're going to show mercy through patience, it means that we have to endure things that we would really rather not have to endure. But that is what we will do if we belong to Jesus. Jesus tells us that those who are merciful are blessed because they're able to show mercy. And we are blessed because we have received mercy and we will receive mercy in the future when we stand before the Lord. Now, tonight, let's look at the next beatitude. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. I think Jesus here is speaking of a broader characteristic, one that really encompasses uh, all of them, a virtue that is the source or the fountain of, of virtually all of these things. And what he's talking about here is moral purity, or what we would call uh, holiness. Now, there's at least three aspects to holiness, uh, three different ways in which the word is used, each of which carries the idea of separation, separation from something to something. Now, holiness can mean separation from the world to God, and that's certainly true of us if we belong to Jesus. We have been separated from this world, from the kingdom of this world, from the kingdom of darkness, and we have been brought into the kingdom of God. The Bible says we are a holy people, which means we belong to Him. It doesn't always mean that we are morally holy, but it does mean that we belong to Him. In the Old Testament, that certainly was its meaning. Um, everyone whom the Lord set apart to Himself was holy, but not all of them were morally pure, even though that is what He called them to be. Now, it also refers to separation from sin. It can refer to the results of being forgiven, of having been washed from our sins. In the Lord Jesus Christ, we are pure and we are holy, and that is why we can enter into heaven, because of that uh, imputed holiness. But it can also refer to the process of sanctification, of, that, uh, of being progressively separated from sin, and of course, being made more like Jesus. Uh, when Jesus did the work that He did and gave us His Holy Spirit, He broke the power of sin in our lives. The Holy Spirit introduced a new principle in our hearts. He gave us love, love for what is good, and that love continually moves us towards what is good and away from what is evil or what is sinful. And remember, that principle of love is the Holy Spirit Himself in our hearts, working His nature, His image in us. Now, when we think about the three uses, separation from the world to God, separation from really the guilt of our sins, and separation from 
the evil that is within our hearts, holiness in these three different ways. I do believe Jesus here means primarily the third one, which is a result of the first two. You know, we are separated from the world to God. We do belong to Him. Our sins are forgiven, but He is making us more like Jesus. He is purifying us, making us holy. Now, remember uh, to whom He's speaking in the Sermon on the Mount. He's speaking to His disciples who were Jews. He's speaking to the Jewish people who were gathered around to listen to what Jesus was teaching His disciples. And all these people had been indoctrinated by the scribes and the Pharisees. And we've just seen in the meditation what it is they were thinking with regard to moral purity or being pure in heart. These religious leaders had gotten it entirely wrong. They believed that the purity that God wanted was somehow merely external, that it was enough merely to conform to what He said to do outwardly, and that the heart or their motive did not really matter. Now, either they didn't understand, or if they did understand, it didn't seem to matter, that just going through the motions, just looking clean outwardly while having a corrupt heart, uh, is really hypocrisy because you're not really doing what's in your heart to do. You're only doing what you do to put on a show for other people or maybe even a show for God. It's only an act. That's essentially what hypocrisy means. I think you've probably heard that uh, ancient actors, Greek actors on the stage were called hypocrites. That's, uh, that was a word that meant actor. They were acting like something they were not, and that's what hypocrisy is, acting like something which you are not like inwardly. God wants obedience, but He wants it from the heart. He wants it from pure motives, from holy motives, uh, and essentially those amount to two. He wants us to do it out of love for Him and out of a desire for His glory, which sometimes we wonder if there's really any difference between those two, but there is. So we have to do it out of love from the heart and not merely externally. And again, that's why Jesus said what He said to these leaders in our meditation, which we'll read again now, Matthew 23, 25 through 26. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup and of the dish, but inside they are full of robbery and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and of the dish so that the outside of it may become clean also. Jesus, again, was telling them they needed to have their hearts cleansed by faith, by trusting in Him, so that their lives would be transformed into His image from the inside out. Essentially, they missed the point that every old covenant believer understood. We need to remember the scribes and Pharisees do not represent the religion that God gave to His people originally. This is not what God wanted at any time in history. Those who really knew Him, even in the Old Covenant, knew what it was that He wanted. Listen to what David writes in Psalm 51, verse 6. Behold, you desire truth in the innermost being, and in the hidden part you will make me know wisdom, which is why David prays later in the same psalm, in verse 10, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. He is essentially asking for the removal of guilt, but also that corruption, which is what Jesus is talking about here. Blessed are the pure in heart. God desires obedience from a pure heart. And we're not surprised, of course, to know that that's exactly what our Lord Jesus Christ gave to him throughout the entirety of his life. I don't think I need to labor this point because we all know that Jesus was absolutely pure. Jesus is the spotless Lamb of God, spotless as far as guilt, spotless as far as corruption. His whole desire was to please his Father and to finish the work that he sent him to do. His, his life was so impeccable that he even challenged his opponents on one occasion. John 8, verse 46. Which one of you convicts me of sin? Now, they may have hurled accusations at him, but none of these 
would ever stick because nobody could make a charge stick against Jesus. He was absolutely blameless. And the only way that you can live that kind of life would be to have a heart that is free of sin. If there's sin in your heart, it will express itself outwardly in some way. Jesus, to live this kind of life, had to have a perfectly pure heart. And we know that's the kind of heart that he had. Now, that's the kind of heart that he needed to have, of course, to offer to God perfect obedience, that he needed to enter into heaven. I mean, Jesus had to be justified too. That sometimes we forget about that. He had to obey perfectly in order to enter into heaven, but he had to obey perfectly to get us into heaven. He didn't do this just for himself. He did it for us. He had to be pure in heart and have an absolutely pure life in order to qualify as our sin bearer. If he had sinned, he would not have been able to pay for his own sins not to mention our sins. And this is what he had to be if he was to make us a holy people by giving us his Holy Spirit. But what Jesus is telling us here is this is what we also need to be if we are to enter into heaven. And so this is the blessing that Jesus came to provide for us in the new covenant by his Holy Spirit. The Lord says through Ezekiel the prophet in Ezekiel 36 verses 25 and 26 as he was looking forward to the work that he was going to do through his son and what the results were going to be. He says, then I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols, okay, removal of guilt. Moreover, I will give you a new heart and I will put a new spirit within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. This is that change of heart. Remember Top Lady's uh, hymn, Rock of Ages, you know, uh, you know, let the water and the blood from thy riven side which flowed be of sin the double cure. Cleanse me from its guilt and its power. What we're talking about here is that, that being free from the power of sin and having a heart that loves the Lord. That's what purity of heart is all about. Now, that is what the Lord has, in fact, given to us if we have trusted in Him. Again, Jesus says in Matthew 5, verse 8, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. I, I probably don't have to remind you of this, but you do realize He doesn't mean that our hearts are absolutely pure. Even after the Lord has given to us His Holy Spirit, we still have sin in our hearts. But because He's put His Spirit in our hearts, this is the kind of heart we want to have, one which is absolutely pure. We are grieved, as we saw earlier in the uh, Beatitudes, we are grieved by the fact that we are not more like Jesus than we are, that we're not humbler than we are that we're not grieved over our lack of humility and our lack of the other virtues more than we are or of the sins of those around us, that we're not gentler than we are, that we're not hungering and thirsting after righteousness more than we are, as we should be, that we're not more merciful than we are, and we also grieve over all the rest of our defects. But like the other virtues that Jesus speaks of in the Beatitudes, we are continuing our struggle to grow as we're called to in Scripture. Paul writes to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 7, verse 1, Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Uh, this is our desire. This is what we're, of course, called and commanded to do. This is what the Spirit of God gives us the ability to do. This is what it means to be like Jesus. So by His grace, we are pure in hearts. We have that grace in our hearts, but we're growing in that purity. We're growing in sanctification. We're doing what we can to kill those sins that still you know, remain within us, we still fight against them, we try not to feed them, and we struggle to put on the heart of our Lord Jesus. 
Blessed are the pure in heart. That's true of us if we are believers in the Lord Jesus. This is what we are doing. But again, sometimes we lose sight of it, and sometimes we need to be reminded so that we can renew our pursuit of it. Now, Jesus tells us that if this is true of us, if our hearts have been purified, if the reigning power of sin has been broken in our lives by the Holy Spirit, if we are growing in holiness, then, then we are blessed because we will see God. By the way, everybody's going to see God someday, but he's talking about a specific view of God, a particular way of seeing him. Now, Jesus might mean here that we will see him in this life. Uh, Psalm 1 is one of the many reminders we have in Scripture that when we are walking in the Lord's ways and we do what is pleasing to Him, God reveals His face to us, His face of blessing, right? When we walk in His paths, we see God. Actually, you know, in one of the, in the ironic benediction, the Lord, you know, be gracious to you, lift up His countenance upon you, show you His face of blessing. So Jesus could mean that, but I think what He's more likely referring to here is, again, what we call the beatific vision which means that blessed vision, that blessed sight of God, the sight of God that brings blessing, which we're only going to see in heaven, and we can only get to heaven through this purity of heart. Now, God tells us in His Word that He is holy. We're just saying about the holiness of God, holy, holy, holy. And being holy, He tells us in Habakkuk 1.13 that His eyes are too pure to approve evil. We know that God doesn't approve of evil. And that he cannot look on wickedness with favor. That's why he sent his son. If he was to have a people in his presence, the sin problem had to be dealt with. It's why he sent his son to cleanse us of our sins, to remove the guilt. And that's why the Father and the Son gave us the Holy Spirit to break the power of sin to give us the ability to grow in holiness and to prepare us for heaven. You know, Jonathan Edwards, again, once asked the question, why doesn't God just take us to heaven when he saves us? You know, you trust in Jesus and poof, you're gone. Well, it's for a couple of reasons. For one thing, he does want a witness on earth, so he wants other people to come to him, and we need to be those people that bring the gospel to him. But another thing he brought up that was kind of interesting is that God wants to prepare us for heaven. He wants to make us fit for heaven. He wants to make us desire heaven more. Now, let me ask you the question, as you learn more about God, as you walk through life with Him, don't you find that desire to be with Him growing, particularly as the evil of the world seems to be growing around us? So He does this to prepare us for heaven. And by the way, Edwards understood, as we understand, that even if we don't reach a certain point in that growth and holiness, in that preparation, if we die somewhere in the process, we're still going to enter there by His grace so that we might see Him and be blessed. Now, as I thought about this, I, I thought of something that I don't think I've ever heard anybody talk about before, but it's kind of an interesting idea. But the beatific vision, the blessed vision of God, that this is what Jesus sees right now. We usually think of Jesus as, as being a part of that vision, and certainly He is. We'll get to see Jesus in His glorified humanity. But what we're talking about here is God in all of His glory uh, revealed. Jesus sees the beatific vision. He sees the, this blessed side of God. Now, again, this might seem somewhat confusing because it sounds like I'm saying that Jesus isn't God and that's not what I'm saying. We do know that He is the second person of the Godhead. We do know that the person who is in the man Christ Jesus is a divine person, the same person as the second person of the triune God, and He has two natures. But He is also in our nature. He is fully human as well as divine. Now, when we're talking about Jesus, when we're talking about our mediator, the one who is our savior, the one who, who did what was necessary to save us, we're talking about the man that he became. 
the man he became at the incarnation, the man that he will forever be, and remember that being in that human nature does not mean that he's not in the divine nature. He has both. Paul writes in 1 Timothy 2.5, and think about it in these terms. For there is one God and one mediator also between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. So we have to take into account that, that he is fully man. Now, that man is now in heaven, and he sees God. He sees, he's seated at the right hand of, of the Father. And I think when we, when we uh, read about that, we need to understand that the Father there is really, I believe, representing or a visible representation of all three of the persons. Jesus, in a certain sense, as a man, when he sees the beatific vision, is actually seeing his own divine glory because he has that glory, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that revelation of their glory in heaven is the beatific vision. Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father and he sees it. And when he sees it, he's basically seeing his own divine glory and he is blessed by it. An interesting idea. Now, if we are trusting Jesus, again, if the power of sin is broken in our hearts, if we're no longer under the control of sin, under bondage of sin, we're fighting against all of our sins, and we are growing in holiness, becoming more like Jesus by the power of His Spirit, then we, like Jesus, will see God. We will see that blessed vision. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means, as far as we can understand currently, it means that we will see God as He reveals Himself again in all His glory. And we want to just kind of think about that for a minute. What does it mean to do that? What, what is the benefit of, of seeing that? Well, for one thing, uh, whatever it is, this is what the saints of all ages have wanted, even from the very beginning. Uh, Job, who was basically a contemporary with Abraham, wanted to see God. And he knew that one day he actually would. And he, he, in this particular reference I'm going to make, he talks about seeing God from his flesh with his own eyes. Now, we understand that what that means is that he somehow understood and believed in the resurrection. Now, he may not have understood what happens directly after he dies. He may not have understood what we call the intermediate state where your body's in the ground and your soul is with the Lord in heaven until the day of resurrection when they're reunited and you stand before God. But he did know at least that he was going to be raised and he would see God. And the reason why he knew that was because he had trusted the mediator who was coming. He, he had faith in him. He trusted Jesus. That's the only way anyone has ever been saved. But this is what he says in Job 19, verses 26 and 27, about that experience. He says, Even after my skin is destroyed, yet from my flesh I shall see God, whom I myself shall behold, and whom my eyes will see, and not another. My heart faints within me. Now, he wasn't saying he was fainting because of fear but he was fainting because of what he had to look forward to and what he would actually see on that day. Uh, when you see the glory of God, it does cause you to somewhat melt away. Uh, even when angels appear, sometimes it would, just the glory of their appearance would cause someone to faint dead away. Uh, John, as he's relating the, uh, you know, the vision in the book of Revelation, more than once, you know, falls at the feet of the one speaking to him. Uh, it has that effect. Job wanted to see God, and he knew when he saw him it would be uh, amazing. Now, Moses didn't want to wait until he got to heaven, and so on one occasion he actually asked God to see his glory right at that moment. We read in Exodus 33, verses 18 and 19, Then Moses said, I pray you, show me your glory. And he said, I myself will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim the name of the Lord God before you, or the Lord before you, and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show compassion on whom I will show compassion. As you know, he went on to say, no one can see my face and live. But he was going to show him at least what he could bear of his glory at that particular moment because Moses wanted to see it. 
And then Paul encouraged the believers at Corinth that this is actually what we will see one day. This is what we have to look forward to. That's what Paul was writing about when he says in 1 Corinthians 13, 12, for now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know fully, just as I have been fully known. So the desire is there, but the question is still why? You know, why did they desire to see God? Well, at least, for at least two reasons. First of all, it's a blessing to see his face because we're there to see it. <laughs> because if we weren't there, you know, where would we be? Okay, so it's a blessing to see the face of God because you're, you have to be in heaven to see this. But it's also a blessing because to look at God, and here's where we have to use our imaginations, is to see the greatest possible beauty. Now, we all appreciate beauty. You know, we, we see beauty in various forms and we like to take pictures of it and we like to look at it, right? Beauty, by definition, is something that is a pleasure to look at. Well, God is beautiful. God is perfect beauty. God is infinite beauty. Everything that is truly beautiful is in Him. So to see Him at just once is to want to continue to look at Him forever. And that is what Jesus tells us that we will do by His grace. We will see the beauty and the glory of God, and that will be the greatest blessing that we could ever have. Now, there's, there's many other blessings that come with heaven, but that is the greatest blessing. Plus, no sin, no corruption of heart, pure love towards God, pure love towards one another. But when we see that vision, we will love it. We will love Him more than we've ever loved Him before. And again, if we can add Edwards to the equation, we'll see more and more of it as we go through time, and our blessedness will increase as we see more and more of that beauty and that glory of God. Now, again, this is what Jesus is looking at. This is what he sees. This is what the saints of all ages have desired, and if they have trusted Jesus, that is what they see right now. And it's what we will see if we are trusting in the Lord Jesus and growing in moral purity, which is one of the evidences that we actually belong to him. If these virtues are in us and they are increasing, we will see God. Well, let's, uh, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we? And let's thank the Lord that he has such a glorious future in store for us. But let's also pray that he would give us the grace to grow into the likeness of Jesus.